Great relationships don't just happen. If you want one, you've got to make it yourself. But how do you do that when you didn't have the models and examples that you needed? Some of us were lucky enough to have seen one or two solid marriages growing up. But that's not really enough since what worked for them isn't necessarily going to work for you. And lots of us just started doing marriage and love and relationships the way we thought was expected. Only to find ourselves in a love story that's, I don't know, okay, I guess? There's no right one right way to do love. That's good news. You can let go of all that old baggage and craft a marriage or partnership or chosen family or polycule or whatever that is so much more than okay. It's really the creation of a life that finally feels like home. At least that's what doing this has felt like for me. Me too. And getting here wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for us. We learned the hard way, the very hard way, that love is a verb. And the actions of love don't just come naturally. We all need skills and tools and support to do this well. And that's completely normal. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton, research psychologist and ASEC certified sexuality educator. I'll be sharing personal stories, evidence-based research, and case studies from my work as a relationship coach. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Um, I'm a human doing my best to make relationships my biggest priority in life. We're going to dig deep and offer vulnerable conversations between us as we keep learning how to customize our love and keep growing as individuals. As individuals. As individuals. And as a couple. And as a moresome. It's all very interesting. And we're also going to have some amazing, nuanced conversations with experts who can help you learn more ways to design the life you want. And if you find yourself saying at any point, damn, I really needed to hear that while you're listening, I would love it, we would love it, if you would head over and give us a quick rate and review on iTunes. It really does help other people find us, and we'd be so grateful for that. Now, it's time to reimagine your relationship from the ground up. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. Hey, so we have an interesting episode this week. We are talking with Mariah Brown. Yeah, so I asked Mariah to join us for an episode because we don't talk, you and I, we have not talked very much about the body yet. Not yet. Not yet. Um, and it's. I think it's important to start having the conversations um, about how, you know, having a body, having a body. <laughs> um, impacts it matters. our it, relationships. It, it influences things. It, do, it, it does matter. And, and there's the thing. I think I have shied away from talking about the body because I, <laughs> I am fascinated by and dominated by my mind. And yet, over and over and over again, life has shown me that The thing I have to do is turn some attention, at the very least, some attention to the fact that I am a body, too. I also have a body. I am an embodied soul. And so we, um, in talking with Mariah, we talk a lot about how the interactions between the body and how you experience the world. And how the world experiences you. Right. So the reason I think this is relevant and why I was excited to talk to Mariah specifically is because, um, well, she's one of the leading experts in talking about bodies of perimenopausal and menopausal cisgender women and how they that the experience of being in perimenopause, being in menopause will impact your whole life, your, and, and. You're, she uses the word libido a lot, and it's kind of cool because I, she uses the word libido in a way that actually is authentic to its earlier use. Mm. Libido was meant to mean your passion for life, your, your drive, like the, that force that just pours out of you and has you wanting to be in life. Right. It's about much more than sex, which is what right. people often think about. Right. And so when, when we're talking about this, keep that in mind that when we're talking about libido, we're talking about sex in a yes and way. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> this is a, um, if, if you're experiencing um, deep exhaustion and a lack of interest 
in sexual connection, intimate connection, in relational connection. There are a lot, there are a lot of reasons that might be true. A lot of reasons, yeah. Um, You might, I mean, it is completely reasonable that it's not that you don't like sex, you just don't like what you're being offered. There's that. Um, but it could that, be because your house is entirely being renovated and you don't live there anymore and it's been a weird summer and and, and then things feel weird. Sex noise coming from the tent is awkward for everyone involved. There are so many factors that, that can influence that. That is not a that. real story. Yeah. So, no. <laughs> no. That, totally those, not a true story. Don't okay. mind those overly specific details. <laughs> okay. I think that when when we start talking about the body, though, it's important to acknowledge in this episode, we're specifically talking about... Um, cisgender, largely heterosexual women, mm-hmm. right? And, and and the reason I want to be really cautious about just telling people that is that the experience of women is in, it's enormous and varied and complex, and women are women. I am not here for any turf nonsense. Yep. I, am, nope. I am not here for um, excluding people who are um, transmasculine and who have... Um, to handle estrogen and have to handle um, have, having a uterus like that we're going to deal with that like grown ups because we are and women are women but for the context of this interview we are talking about cisgender women and Mariah specializes in helping people in fairly mononormative heterosexual mm-hmm. contexts right. and there's there's a lot to be said in that context and about that context And I found it very useful as a largely boy-based person myself, socialized male. And um, um, the discussions about the the, uh, cis female experience, it's generally been kind of brushed aside. And now we it's it's important to bring those conversations up and out loud and and get them on the world. Yeah. So I think what I want to just say is this should be one of many conversations. Yes. And if you don't experience your gender and sexuality in a way that aligns with this, I hope you'll tune in for future episodes yes, be- that might be a better fit. I'm looking for other experts to talk to mm-hmm. about those specialties. Those conversations need to be out in the world too. Absolutely. But something that came up in this um, interview that I think is really, um, it hit home for me, was that when we when we're young, we get divided up amongst. Oh yeah. <laughs> we get divided up into two boxes. Um, boys shunt at boys. Great big air quotes around that. People we assume are boys and people we assume are girls. And let's like label them and shunt them off to separate rooms to talk about sex and bodies and not even sex like sex for fun or pleasure. Just like hey, the you mechanical. have a body and you know you're going to bleed mm-hmm. and you're not. So I guess let's just hang out and we'll read a comic book about something. I don't even know what they talk to you guys about because. Uh, y'all didn't seem to get a lot from it, so I don't, we're Gen Xers. I don't think those conversations yeah, I mean, went well. I, I, my, mine goes back quite a ways, and I don't think the gym teachers who taught us were necessarily prepared to teach those um, classes. Okay, I'm just going to say it. they weren't. I know they weren't. Yeah. I know those people. No, they weren't. Oh, yes, you so, know. Yes, you know them. <laughs> so here's the thing having these conversations now one of the things that it does for me is help me realize why I acted some of the ways I acted in my earlier relationships and that sets me up to better understand what I consider to be normal in my current relationships in my current understanding of relationships so I think about okay so you're in fifth grade and you get divided up into these two conversations now fast forward you're in high school and you're you're wrestling with an onslaught of hormones and trying to figure out life and you start dating or having sex or and all this stuff fast forward a few years i find myself married and now i'm amongst the group of married adults right so i just know how the world works Mm -hmm. which couldn't be more bullshit yeah i knew nothing i knew less than nothing because i thought i knew things and part of why i thought i knew things is because since nobody really talked about it and they just offered us a basically a pamphlet, I didn't understand how my body worked. God knows I didn't understand how my partner's body <laughs> worked. And even as I was scrambling to get information, I was scrambling to get information about what was relevant right then. So I started having babies young. So I was scrambling for information on, on um, being pregnant and getting pregnant, nursing, giving birth. Parenting, specific... and then parenting as a couple uh-huh. and figuring out how to do that. Having a sex life after. 
And it still just left me, I was always scrambling, but also it was totally boxed off from the experience my partner was having and also what my friends were having, especially the ones who weren't in bodies exactly like mine. I think we just have to have these conversations yes. and keep having them Lots because now I'm them. realizing mm -hmm. that, you know, as I, now I'm in perimenopause and I'm realizing that I don't know even what I don't know. And so I don't even know how to help you support me, right? So we're, here we are yep. in our anchor partnership. Um, we live together and it's hard for me to ask for help with stuff that I don't know is going on. If my orgasm shifts or changes, if my, which it has, I mean, I've, I've had bouts of anorgasmia where I just, it's just gone. It's just gone. I get real disturbed about that. But I've had, I've also had times of intensely high libido, intensely high drive. And you have had these things, these times of up yep. and down. Normalizing conversation about this with more between more than just the couple because I, right. what yep. I'm noticing is we're so insular. Yeah. Even though we are polyamorous, we're insular about this because, like day to day, we're the people who we talk about yep. with this stuff. And in situations like that, there are things that I might not mention to you because it doesn't occur to me that they're a thing even until I hear somebody else say it, and then I realize, oh, this is how people can be. Oh, let me tell you this. Because it's so easy for me as a very, you know, having many narcissistic tendencies and really liking to think about myself, I will think, well, this is true about me. It must be true about everybody. There's no point even talking about it. And the more we have these conversations, the more I realize how little is tr that's true. And how little, little each of our individual experiences is generalizable. That's it. Right. Yes. Right. So... E, you're, you identify as non-binary slash masculine. Yes. Right? Okay. So your experience of being in a body, it, it is different from every other human yep. I've ever met. And I struggle sometimes to, to figure out what questions I should ask you to understand what you're going mm -hmm. through. And that's with a relatively stable system that you've had, yep. yeah, re relatively speaking. Yep. My body has changed a ton. Uh, I, I have gained and lost weight. I have grieved. I have had, um, I've had babies. I've nursed children. I've gone through massive, um, athletic endeavors, didn't dived into those and had everything about my body. Been through all change. these dynamic right. changes and experiences. And now I'm in perimenopause and it occurs to me that you weren't great about asking questions about all those other things. No, I was not. And you're not great about asking questions about these, but I actually want to let you off the hook. I wasn't great about asking questions. I also got stuck in, well, what's happening for me is just what's happening. And while that's great from that's a like mindfulness-based perspective, like staying in the moment, it often left me feeling both alone and un helpless. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, I'm grieving right now and I'm, I'm just awash in this grief and... I don't know how to ask for help and I don't know what to do about it. And it's changing how I feel in my body. Yeah. And it's changing how I feel about sex. It's changing how I, feel. ugh. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how to talk about it. And, and I still through. run into the, my own internal walls, my upbringing, my personality, whatever, that prevent me from asking questions. Like that prevent. You know, I, I might not think to or whatever. And um, yeah, so the, the curiosity, mm -hmm. it, it, De leaning into the curiosity and asking questions about what's your experience look like right now because I have no reason to believe that I know what it is. Right. It's it's reminding me that one of one of the best date habits that we have had over the years, and I feel a little disconnected from it right now during all the chaos we have in our life, but a good dating habit we've had is to basically go on curiosity dates, yep. asking questions the whole date. In fact, I have a... a a pamphlet full of questions yeah. just to help people like understand. And I've like, used it over and over. <laughs> right. Just to ask questions, but also um, to go on some deep dive dates. We, when you were first diagnosed with MS, yep. we took a, a couple different nights and we, we just, we just talked about it. Talked we imagined into what the futures and... might be, but we also, I was doing a lot of research. I shared the research with you. Like we decided to spend our us time like really exploring deeply into how things had changed now that you had this diagnosis. Right. It was about the fact that you had a body, but it impacted every aspect yeah. of our relationship. 
and I would invite everybody to, to do that. You don't need a diagnosis to have a desire to find out what's going on with your partner. Right. So it's making me think right now we should have a perimenopause Yep, date. that's what I was And we can both too. go do some reading and some learning. Yeah. And I, I, Mariah gave us some wonderful starting points mm -hmm. for conversation um, and for reflection on how is this? What is my normal and what is how? where am I? Where am I not feeling supported? Whether that's in my nourishment or mm -hmm. in my relationship, where where yep. could I use some support to figure out how to handle this next phase of my existence? Yeah, you know, it's a, a small topic like just, that. Yeah, just yeah. a little <laughs> thing like that. I think this is it. It's powerful and meaningful, and I hope it's one of many conversations we're going to have about the body. And I know that that's true because you and I are both moving through the process of certifying in uh, neurosomatic intelligence coaching. So that's coaching, going to inspire more conversations. And shifting us into a space where we're having more conversations about the body in general. Mm -hmm. That's exciting too. It is. So Mariah Brown is, well, she's amazing for one thing, um, and a wonderful speaker. Mariah is a Yale um, and functional medicine trained certified nurse midwife. Um, she helps ambitious women feel turned on by their life. And she really helps people to be turned on, in, on by everything in their lives. And that's what makes me excited about her work. She doesn't want you to just want sex. She wants you to want your life. That's exciting. She's also a mom, a wife, and a CEO who left her Fortune 50 corporate career to serve women. Um, she midwives women through chapters of change in areas of their energy, their hormones, their libido, their confidence. And she has a deep appreciation and respect for food as medicine and mindset and how mindset affects everything. Um, her work online brings her 22 years of experience supporting women together in one place to co-create deep transformation and ener energy and passion. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Have a listen. Hello, Mariah. Hi. So nice to see you. And Hello and welcome. Yeah, this is... So you and Ken are meeting for the first time. You and I have spoken before. I am thrilled to have you in front of our audience because you specialize in something that I think women need to know about, all humans need to know about, that I just don't cover. It's not in my special specialty, but it is incredibly relevant to my work. So I consider mm -hmm. you a just a huge asset to to have existing in the world and for my my audience our audience to get to know that you exist so thank you could we just open up and you tell us a little bit about who you are i've I, they heard your bio but who are you for real yeah yeah <laughs> sure so i am a midwife i'm a mom and i'm a ceo and i'm also a wife and you know i've been working i left fortune 50 in 2003, I think it was, because I really realized my calling was to work with women in a deep way. And it was to be a doula and then to be a midwife. And, I, you know, I've worked all over West Africa, Central America in international health projects and ended up at Yale doing my kind of traditional training and then also functional medicine trained. And now I'm all online. And so not necessarily showing up as a provider from the perspective of let me write you a prescription. But more, I say that I midwife women through chapters of change. Oh, and yes, it's for women, but it's also for the, the men. If, if they're in heterosexual relationships or they're in, they have brothers and fathers. And I mean, it's men and women that I think really value from kind of opening up to the, the different areas in which physiology impacts our well-being and our passion and our hormones and our energy and our mood and our weight and all the stuff. All the stuff. There's the yeah. thing, I, you know, so Ken and I were talking um, before this recording about should he come into the interview or not? Because I've done a few without him. And sometimes it's it's really nice to just have a, you know, girl chat, right? I identify as woman and I was born a cisgender body. Um, I uh, labeled as female when I was born. So there's something very easeful, right? About being in a conversation with you about hormones and what to expect from our estrogen and all of that. However, I looked yeah. at Ken and I thought, yeah, I don't want this to be like fifth grade when we separate the boys from the girls as Assuming if gender was that yeah, so simple. That matters. And then 
just tell the girls, so you're going to bleed for like a quarter of the rest of your life and just make sure no one knows about it, especially if they have a penis. Let's not do that. <laughs> it's totally, yeah. I don't know about you, but I, many of the women in my space, um, the thing I hear most often in, well, there's so, so many things that I hear, but one of the things that's just come up recently as we're talking about libido and the shame and guilt that are associated with it is so many women come to me and say, I wish that there would have been more conversations, not just the superficial kind of like tuck it behind, but can we actually really talk about this stuff? And I think for me, my upbringing was very non-traditional. I had lots of different variations of parents, depending on what age growing up. And my mother and stepfather were part of Rajneesh, the Osho movement. I don't know if you know much about it, but in Eastern Oregon, we spent time there in the summer and it was a very open sexual space. And our home in Ashland, Oregon was known as the Rajneesh home. I'm doing um, little quotations by my head. And so there was always people coming through the home from all over Europe and India. And they were just, all, there was this constant migration for me as it from age four to six. Mm. And so I just, um, I find that there's, I don't, I don't necessarily relate to that. And yeah. so we just get to go, well, let's, let's talk about this, take the guilt and shame away and what's really coming up for you. But then of course, I think what we're talking about today is more physiology. <laughs> so I, yeah. Well, well, but it, the idea of that, um, that your physiology, your knowledge of physiology and your support of women is um, like the idea that as a man presenting critter, I could be involved in that conversation and should be and and like and I would want to have you involved as as a and, partner. I would right. want and to have so you involved. You in had it. this open experience and I had a very traditional experience of middle school in the 70s of um yep, totally separated by this fictitious gender thingy and okay we're going to tell you this group a bunch of stuff and this group a bunch of stuff and you're not going to talk about it because we put the taboos in place so that you won't talk about it now off you go good luck and i hear you describing a a more integrated experience and um yeah i just want to kind of start sneaking that into the rest of the world. So here yes, I am. Yeah, because it doesn't happen in school. I think the real education, at least in my experience, happened at home based on the way that my parents talked about it. And right. as a women's health provider, you know, for 15 years, I ran the women's health in federally funded clinics and I ran a Planned Parenthood and was attending births and hospital birthing center and home births and also like the private practice functional medicine where you've got 30 teas and a fountain in the waiting room. So that wide variety. And it was always striking to me how many women would come in and we'd be behind closed doors and they would be asking me questions about things going on in their body. And what I was hearing is we've lost our friends, our aunties, our mothers and our grandmothers to talk about this stuff. Like, yeah. wh- why is it so surprising when all the, when vaginal dryness is, is kicking in or irritability is spiked during PMS or there's questions around why is my teenager, why is her menstrual cycle not like clockwork and regular right away? And what do you mean perimenopause can start at age 35? I don't even know what that is. Right. Nobody talked about menopause with me. Yeah. And so it just feels like it's a conversation we, we deserve to have amongst all of us, particularly for a woman who's in a relationship with a man to help him understand and, and prepare for right. when she's going into that, what I consider, you know, fall week of a 28 day cycle yeah. where she's going to feel very different in her body. And so as women can start being aware of that and tracking and preparing for it physiologically and emotionally and socially and, and shifting work, Let's also have conversations in when we're, if we're in relationships with men to help them also understand what's going on with us. Right. And, right. you know, to put on the Teflon suit, <laughs> right. let it all, let it all, Here, roll let it all flow off of you. I, you know, you are, you, we jumped right into the deep end. I think here, I had a conversation in DMS this morning that I think is highly relevant to what we're talking about. Um, so, you know, I talk about non-monogamy all the time. 
So Mm -hmm. people are in various kinds of relationships. And to be clear, um, non-monogamy, I mean, just whatever expansive relationship people want. And one of the things that comes up is if you're going to have multiple relationships, a lot of people get into that initially because they want to have multiple sexual relationships. Now add to the party the fact that your libido, your sexual inclinations, and your body's response to sexual stimuli is not going to be static over the course of your life. I am hearing from more and more people that, uh, you know what? I hit 48 and I've been really cool with my polysexuality. And now what is with this vaginal dryness? What is Mm -hmm. with like, um, it's like I have armor up that I didn't have before. I'm Mm -hmm. noticing trauma located in my pelvis. Like I'm just noticing it. Where the hell did this come from? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited and I would love for you. Could you just start us with a little primer then about? Yeah. Yeah. What's going on? Let's, let's go specifically into perimenopause. So menopause is officially defined by when you've gone 12 months without a bleed. Okay. So the reason we bleed is because we've ovulated, right? So as the, as we stop ovulating, and we kind of move away from the fertility years and more into the years of being the crone and the elder in the community, we stop ovulating. So we stop bleeding. Okay. Now the thing that is kind of striking is perimenopause that lead up the before the menopause can actually start as early as 35. And so average age of menopause is 51 and a half, but some women, they continue to bleed till 55. So there's this potential like 20 year gap of, I kind of think of it as two bookends, meaning puberty and perimenopause. They're very similar mm-hmm. hormonally. There's these big surges of estrogen and then, and then drop in the menstrual cycle starts to get a little bit irregular and mood starts shifting and weight starts shifting. And then as a woman progresses deeper into perimenopause and the estrogen level is dropping and shifting to the type of estrogen, which mm-hmm. I want to touch on. That's important. Oh, yeah. For some women, they have vaginal dryness, changes in libido, um, uh, sleep dep- sleep changes, but also I think of it as a new fierceness. So the estrogen of for their fertility years is called estradiol. Yeah. That's the estrogen of multitasking, mm. right? It's the estrogen I'm going to, you know, attract a maid. I've got a baby on the hip soup on the stove. I'm talking on the phone. I'm able to be handling lots of things all at once. And and my ovulation is happening often and the robustness and the, the, the libido is very different. I want to have sex like a bunny, you know? Yep. And I remember that time. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Literally I could do all the things I used to call it juggling chainsaws. Like, I got it. No problem. Right. Right. And it makes sense physiologically. Plus our DHEA is super high. So our stamina is strong. Our our focus is strong. Our brain clarity is strong. And then as we start to progress closer into menopause, we switch over to a different estrogen, which is called estrone. Mm. The way that I remember it is it has O-N-E in it. One, we become much more single-minded. So some women say, am I having brain fog or Is it just simply that we need to kind of shift the expectations of how we exist? We become more fierce, more unapologetic, more clear in our power. For some women, they have hot flashes or power surges. I love that phrase. That's great. Yeah. 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 That's a, just that reframing from a, from a psychological perspective, just reframing Mm -hmm. a hot flash to a power surge is really helpful. And, and then there's also this time where I, there's a morning. We, whether you wanted to have children or not, or you procreated or not, there's still the morning of the loss of that chapter of, of his life yeah. and the and transition. Yeah. And our relationship with aging. Right. Oh gosh. Right. Heavy, heavy stuff yeah. in this particular culture, in this particular image laden, just youth obsessed. Youth obsessed. Yeah youth obsessed yeah right. which I mean I love youth it's wonderful but I don't know about you but I'll, I'll, I'll turn 46 this summer and I love my 40s deeply mm-hmm. I look mm-hmm. forward to my 50s but every time I open Instagram I am reminded that something is lost and I, yeah I appreciate that you use the word mourning because I talk a lot about 
grief, like not if when we don't make space to grieve what was, even when we're happy about where we're, we've gone, there's a real missing um, element to our growth, our development, our yeah, individuation. Yeah. yeah. And so the analogy that I use is when you think about a caterpillar to the butterfly in the chrysalis, it turns to goo. Goo. I love in the this goo. Is, this is when we're goo. Yeah. And that goo, how spectacular that we're taking on our new form and we're trying on a few different rounds of how about these wings and what is this going to look like? And we become kind of fierce. And then in our relationships, you know, maybe we're kind of like, wait, today, but I do, wait, the next day, I don't want that anymore. And, and I want to relate in this way. And I want to do this job, but now I don't want to do this job anymore. And uh, I think there's this um, shift of not being so much of the people pleaser, and right. actually standing for what we want. Everywhere I turn right now, women in my, my cohort say, everywhere I turn, people are like, oh, the people pleasing I'm done with it. And yeah. that includes in my bedroom, in my, I'm done with people pleasing, which means I need to learn how not to fake orgasms. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I need to learn how to ask for what I want. And I need to let go of a lot of expectation. But it also means at least this is what I see on the psychology side of it is we have to learn how to be with that, that constantly changing desire and not mm-hmm. have an expectation that libido is one thing that is just static and we'll, and, and we should, or can expect ourselves to want the same thing the same way. Yep. And then we need to be with our partners <laughs> and let them know that this is normal and it's not their fault and it's not our fault. This is actually to be celebrated. So yep. how do you work with people? What's your, your move? What, how do you help them work with this change? Well, okay. From a physiological perspective, we have to really deeply care for our adrenals. Because mm-hmm. as the ovaries start slowing down the production of those hormones, it's predominantly the adrenals that take over the brunt of the work. Mm-hmm. Estrogen is also s- stored in adipose tissue. It, it, there's a lot of areas in our body that that's fat, a lot of areas in our body that produce it, but really it's the adrenals. Mm-hmm. And so helping women, I always say rest is not required. Rest is not earned, it's required. And a lot of really- go, but really, truly, we do need to practice stress reduction and rest in the best way and stop the people pleasing and serving everybody and really focus on, am I well hydrated? And am I feeding myself good food? And am I getting in my adaptogens every day and caring for my adrenals so that the hormone production continues? Mm. Um, For both men and women, adding in DHEA is lovely. Mm -hmm. If you can, in the U.S., you can get it over the counter and it's a hormone precursor. So it turns into both estrogen and testosterone and it, it decreases for all of us starting around age 30. And so, um, and I think something very simple is just allow for lots of lubrication and get really playful with it. And as the physiology changes, we can't, we have to stop expecting that we're going to create all the lubrication like we did in our twenties, yes. get some fun lube and play with it a bunch and, and allow it yes. to take the pressure off when you're, when you're having fun and bring in lots of lube, lots of lube. If if anyone who's listening, who is not currently sporting at least a couple of bottles of lube everywhere, they might even consider having any sort of intimate fun. Go grab them right now. I carry one in my purse for God's sakes. I have a (laughs) a beautiful Uber lube dispenser. That's like stainless and it, and it's per yeah, everywhere. I I will, I will pass without it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> for, for if you're sexually active and you're not needing condoms, I actually like oil-based. So even if you're just using jojoba oil, almond oil, sesame seed, go grab olive oil from the kitchen or make love in the kitchen and grab some olive oil, but use a lot of it and make it playful and fun. My favorite, I actually have a wonderful recommendation. If you aren't using condoms and you can use an oil-based, go to Mr. Butter's. Mr. Butters has, oh my gosh, this lubricant, I swear it changed everything about my experience of having a vulva because I've never been a lubricator. It's just not my way. I don't have like, it's a, I know how to get turned on. I know how to turn myself on. That's just not what my body does. And that's fine. 
But this lube was a game changer. It actually changed the kinds of sex I wanted to have because it's so nourishing and yummy. And I don't use it with all partners because sometimes I am using condoms, obviously. Um, but with my partner that I am fluid bonded to, oh, it's just the best. It's, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's actually better than, than anything. Like, I think people misunderstand that lube isn't just a, an add-on. It can actually be supportive and that's yeah. fun. And fun and it can taste good and it can be playful and rub it on your belly and rub it on your nipples and just allow it to be fun and, and take the pressure off. I think so uh, many women, they expect that they have to be the producer of all of it. Right. And, and allow the conversation to be taking, go ahead. I see that you're about to speak, Ken. (laughs) So one of the things that I'm hearing in all of this is to acknowledge what's real and actual and lean into it and make what's actually happening and going to happen fun versus playing some game, uh, trying to act, acting as though the world, what I as a 55 year old man was, was sort of told by the culture, yeah. which is that, yep, yeah, education is the, you know, that it's that's correct. how things should be, all these shoulds. And, mm-hmm. and I hear you two just saying, okay, yeah, but, but what's <laughs> real is this. And so there are, it's, so do that. Yes. So, so live according to the, what the reality versus the illusion. And yeah. And I love that you said playfulness because so Ken and I struggled with this at the beginning of our relationship because he, he had never really used lube. It it just hadn't, it's never entered his frame of reference around intimacy. I mean, the, the prudishness that I was brought up in was an added element to my sociological And then even going, because now it's a process of like anything that I buy in order to make my sex life better, right? There's a layer, there can be a layer of shame around it that is invisible to us because your grown up self, I'm sure doesn't think that there's anything. I mean, you brought, you bought menstrual products for me without skipping yeah, a beat, I, yep. but you didn't even know how to go about selecting a lube, no. right? It just, right. And that's fine. So today that can change for anybody who's listening. It, it really just takes one conversation to change that. And I would say, isn't it the same? I'm guessing you see this all the time. Isn't it the same with like how we choose to nourish our bodies? bodies. Take in one yes, conversation, yes. shift how you think about what would yeah. be supportive for your body. Right. Yes. And so we also want to hydrate well and eat lots of quality fats and and Testosterone levels we are dropping. Well, let's address those, you know. And so I'm not suggesting that everybody just go add a DHEA, but the the best test in my perspective on the marketplace is called the Dutch test. It looks through urine and saliva, mm-hmm. and we can get a really nice look at a 24 hour cortisol curve and the hormones, predominantly estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, but also how your body metabolizing them. And it says a lot about mood and, and focus and uh, detoxification and propensity towards estrogen dependent cancers, as well as libido and weight. And, you know, for some women, their testosterone might be normal, but based on the way in which it's metabolized down the body, maybe it's, it sends more down the cystic acne and, and extra hair on the face and not so much around the increase in libido. So we get to address it from a physiological perspective. The other thing I wanted to mention in the lubrication conversation is reverie. Are you familiar with reverie? I'm not. I'm not. What's that? So hyaluronic acid, a lot of us mm-hmm. use on our face. Yeah. There's vaginal suppositories that are hyaluronic acid. Oh. So women, as the early signs of vaginal dryness are showing up, reverie is the brand. It's by Bonafide. And so it's just a vaginal suppository that then is adding hyaluronic acid into the vaginal canal. And now we're maintaining more hydration that way. Fascinating. So I find that interesting because one of the things I wind up doing in my role as a sex educator is reminding people not to put stuff in there that, you know, like we hear people saying, put sugar. No, no, do not do not. I mean, I know, I know, you know, your stuff and it's, it can be so um, challenging, I think for people to know 
what's a good idea and what's not. So if, if, um, if in doubt, make sure that you, the person you're relying on the information from really knows what they're talking about, because we don't want any pineapples. We don't want any sugar anywhere near there. So even no douching, no douching, no douching. Right. Everybody hears about the gut microbiome these days. We're 90% and bacteria, only 10% human cells. The brain is the, the gut is the next brain. We also have a vaginal microbiome right. and the vaginal canal is supposed to have an odor. It has all sorts of odors, just like we, we smell fine wine and for, or those that like marijuana, they can smell the different terpenes and it's exciting. And you smell hints of mushroom or blackberry or black currant. Well, a woman's vaginal microbiome also has thousands of different scent molecules. Yeah. And, you know, I always say, how, what man have you ever heard who's offered sex? Say, wait, babe, I want, I think my balls might stink. Let me go take a shower first. <laughs> it's, um, it's the rare and special breed that <laughs> remember to uh, give it a wash, give it a right, little wash. Women are have, external. those are external where, yeah. you know, you do actually want to get the the dirt that may have accumulated on them off and a vaginal tract is not the same thing. No, no. So only water, only water. You can use soap around your anus, but around the vulva, just water, rinse, no douching, no perfumes. Yeah. Um, you know, even you are, and when you don't, it's very clear there, there's a very clear. So when bacterial vaginosis, like when that BV is a particular scene scenario that can come up, I'm sure you're familiar with it. It's not like anything. You will know that. Yeah. It's a very, it's a very distinct fishy odor and the discharge will increase a lot. And even with that, you know, I was trained, you give them antibiotics, but then once again, an antibiotic is going to go in and yes, it's going to tackle the bad bacteria, but also tackle the good. And so sometimes a woman can wait it out, wait till the next menstrual cycle and the body resets. Yep. Other times I've used a compounding pharmacy and just done a boric acid vaginal suppositories instead. Mm. And it tackles it just as well. But it's also for me, a cue that something is off in that vaginal microbiome and the pH is too high. Mm. Wow. And so we can address it nutritionally. There's so much to know about how our bodies work. And mm-hmm. I mean, I, I did, I was a doula. I was studying to be a midwife when I chose a different, I, I took a, a right turn. Um, but I, there's like, I feel like every day I am reminded of how complicated our bodies are and how they're divine. They're, divine. They're, they're divine and they're ever changing. They're ever changing. And that's the thing that I think is very unique in, in, female physiology compared to male physiology is we really are exceptionally dynamic. Mm. Like it's not just changing every day, but we are changing from morning to evening. From morning to evening. And then each, each week of a 28 day cycle is distinctly different. You know, I have, I, I did one of a podcast episode just on this to acknowledge that we're different in our body aches and our GI tract and our bloating and our mood but also our desire for creativity, Mm -hmm. our libido, our socialization. And when we look at it as seasons, there is a time when, you know, it's that time to be publishing your book or doing your Ted talk and out there throwing the party, throwing the graduation party. And there's another time in the, in the month where it really serves us better to just bring it in and be connecting with our close, close loved ones. Yeah. Yeah. And the more that we're able to honor that and be in conversations with that, those that we share a household with, with where we are in our 28 day cycle, I think it helps everybody get along better and really honor. Listen, the moon pulls tides. Yeah. Yeah. It can pull us. Right. Pull yeah. Tides. Who are we? So now I have, I have a question about that. So um, you're describing the dynamics of the cycle and there that's, it's awesome. I mean, yes. Uh, female bodies are, complex in a way that that male ones like mine aren't and it's I, I i celebrate that that is awesome um the how do the various uh forms of birth control affect that yeah dynamic cycle because yeah. i actually don't get my my cycle i do not bleed 
Um, I, and I haven't for most of my adult life, I have not bled because I, um, I was breastfeeding for 11 years and I didn't bleed at all while I breastfed. That was just me. Um, and then I, I had a copper ID and I barely bled on that. And with a Mirena, I don't at all. Hmm. I don't at all. So there are just these, and there are other hormonal birth controls that also impact us. So yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's one of the reasons why I highlight that there's a lot more to track, uh, not just our bleeding. Yeah. I think often we think that that's the only thing that we're looking at. And it is you know, ACOG, the American College of Obstetric and Gynecology calls it the fifth vital sign that really when most visits, they don't actually pay close attention to, but bleeding, if, if a woman is still in her fertility years and bleeding, it's important to look at, is it heavy? Is it crampy? Is it red? Is it dark? All that. But there's so much more for us to look at in a 28 day cycle. And so when a woman is on hormonal contraception, it does change it pretty significantly because now we're adding in exogenous pharmaceutical hormones. One really fascinating thing, um, Dr. Sarah Hill wrote a book called Your Brain on the Pill. She's Mm -hmm. out of Texas. And I interviewed her in my podcast. And and one of the things that they're finding in this conversation around adrenals is for some reason, the pharmaceutical progesterone, so progestin, sends the adrenals into hyperdrive and the body loses the negative feedback loop with cortisol, which means a woman's body is pumping out cortisol and doesn't get the message to stop. That is a problem. (laughs) That's a problem. So on one hand, I'm a huge advocate of women taking full um, personal responsibility for their fertility. So hormonal contraception is phenomenal if they know that they don't want to become pregnant or it's not safe for them to become pregnant. I mean, there's so many factors there and post birth control syndrome is a real thing. Mm. And now rather than the woman's body allowing the moon to pull tides, so to speak, they're not ovulating. And so now they're having, if they're having a bleed from depending on which contraception they're on, it's not really a true bleed. The other challenge there is ovulation is what's considered the main event. Mm, Yep. And so ovulation is what the ovulation. Correct. Ovulation is what stimulates a woman's body to produce progesterone. So progesterone goes away. There is. Mm. Now we lose our progesterone production and progesterone is that it's, it's like, I think of it as like, um, the calmer. Mm. the, the emulsifier, the, um, the thing that kind of takes the edge off, it balances our estrogen. And so estrogen dominance can lead to the menstrual migraines and fibroids and breast tenderness and cancers and the real strong irritability and the crabbiness. And we, we want to balance it with progesterone. And so if we're not ovulating, we lose that main event. And so I have concern there. Um, And so then tracking becomes a little bit more difficult because you're not necessarily tracking your bleed time or if it's in a Mirena, you're not going to bleed at all, but you still, I really encourage women to continue to, and even if you're beyond menopause and you're not bleeding anymore, that that woman still has a 28 day cycle. So that I've heard you speak to this before and it, it, it occurred to me that I do track things, but I, I forget to think of it as tracking who I am. Like, tra- like I, for instance, I track migraines. Um, I've had migraines since I was eight. So, you know, it's a thing in my life, but you know, there are so many things to track that I think our relationships highlight, right? Like I, I, <laughs> how I speak to my, my most intimate partners, how yeah. I'm showing up in that relationship. Like there's a big mirror there for me. So I, for instance, don't bleed, but I do sometimes yell. <laughs> and yeah. it's, it's pretty cyclical, even though I am, a, I do have a Marina, which means I'm not bleeding. There you go. It's, it's fascinating to watch how my, how for me, my behavior is a way for me to track my, not just my inner experience, but my physiological inner experience, not just my cycle. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when, you're on the same page. And he also has an idea of when that's coming. You know, for me, 
during that, I, I call it fall. So winter is what I consider the bleeding time if the woman's bleeding. And in that fall time, that's PMS. Yeah. So that's when we're more likely to, you know, just bite. The viper comes out and then we go, gosh, why did I overreact over that? And so we get to preemptively go, okay, I know I'm in that week. If I feel like I want to bite his head off, I'm going to remove myself and go upstairs and just give myself a pause because I know that if I give it two or three days, it probably is going to be just fine. So let me go breathe. Or if you're thinking, I'm going to quit that job. I'm going to leave that relationship. I'm going to cut off that friend, whatever it is, the the rash responsiveness that we have. Now, I think it's important that a few days later, we really look at that and go, okay, that was a true part of something that's within me that I'm desiring. Yeah. But maybe not make the big decision or do the big yelling and and then for our partners and to understand that they get to kind of preemptively prepare that I'm going to be more nitpicky at, at how he's folding the towels, <laughs> which is just silly. It's, right. Silliness that, uh, you know, you're reminding me of the fact that there is an opportunity on both sides of that, on the receiving side too. Ken has a uh, a magic spell that he he invites that that viper he'll invite it for and just embrace the fact that it's happening and and breathe through it and that changed how how we relate because he's just like okay let me without taking this on as a, a measure of me what if I just invite it and I'm like okay this is where we are right now without over identifying with it I, I was that's what i was going to say if if i identify with the rage or whatever judgment is coming at me then i have all of these you know maybe it touches my self-worth or whatever or your little boy parts or my little boy parts uh, but if i take it as well let me see what's in what's happening right now for me what what resonates with my own judgment and opinions of what's going on right now also and those are the relational pieces and then the other stuff, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to let, it let be. that be what it is. And we can deal with that separately from what I actually want. Oh, right. I don't have to respond to everything you're saying. I can pick. Yeah. And I want to engage in this conversation. And you want to have this other part of the conversation. Well, I'm not going to have that right now. We'll have this other one. And and, come, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. I, I'm thinking just about how when we allow hormones to enter the conversation, we have to be cautious not to use them as a, not to weaponize the idea of it. Yes. Right. Not to diminish the other um, in either direction of, you know, when it comes to this, but also to, so if we invite this conversation into our relationship, there is the potential to build a bridge between us, a bridge of understanding. And you, you mentioned that pause. And I was thinking about, um, you know, the, the very intelligent reminder that if you're going to take a pause, just tell the person when you'll be back. And if that's going to okay. be a week, that's fine. Just remind each other that that's what's happening. Yeah. And, and so destigmatizing and so rehumanizing mm-hmm. to do that. The, the other base that I think is relevant in this conversation, because you and I both work with very ambitious yeah. um, individuals that, okay, let's say now we're talking about in the workplace. Right where maybe a man and woman are working together or two women are working together and they're in the boardroom yep. and maybe they're not actually having this conversation about where they are in their cycle. Right. And yet inevitably these same interactions are happening. And so really, I think for me, it's around helping women come into a very empowered self-discovery mm-hmm. so that they're, they're going into their working environment whole in an ideal world being able to kind of own your schedule based on where you are in a 28 day cycle. And if not go in with absolute self-awareness of Mm -hmm. of where, and, and really, truly, you know, in that ovulatory time, that's when the, the, you know, it's the seductress, it's the blossoming. And then the summertime, that's when you're out at the block party and your bathing suit having the big party. And, and so the more that we can honor that, that's how we're, presenting ourselves and our bodies feel different. And that's when we want to wear the cute bra and the thongs and we put on lip lip gloss and we feel super sexy. Mm -hmm. And so that changes the interactions in the work, in the workforce as well, but it does it in a very different way. Sure. Sure. I mean, it's a great time to be doing sales. I love (laughs) selling when I'm in that mode. Mm -hmm. I love it. It's wonderful. Yes. Yes. (laughs) And if we, 
<laughs> right, right. If we signed up to, to make the big sales presentation, but we're, we're in our winter time, our bleeding time. Yeah. And then we're going, oh crap, why did I sign up for this? Right, right. Oh, I love the self-awareness that this invites. I, like another whole way to be self-aware. And it's striking me that this is just such a, an enormous um, undertake. It could feel so overwhelming. I'm guessing that there are folks out there listening right now thinking, cool, Mariah, <laughs> but what should I do right now? Like, I, yep. it's, it's a lot. And what would you say is a good place to start? Like one or two things that somebody- Yes, has- yes. So I mentioned adaptogens really, truly. I think all women should be drinking adaptogen elixirs every single day eating an anti-inflammatory diet, hydrating well, eating all the good quality fats, all of that stuff. Um, I'm a big fan of of seeing the right provider. So often I'll hear women say, you know, here are the things that are going on in my body. And I go to my provider and and I explain my symptoms and they order basic labs, which they don't know are basic. In my mind, I'm hearing basic. And I'm told that everything's normal and here's my prescription. And so number one, if that's been the solution you've been offered and that's not what you're looking for, keep looking. There are other providers out there and there's so much that can be done without a prescription for a drug. Yeah. I think of that as Band-Aid fix. Like let's put a Band-Aid on a festering wound and just pretend it's not there. How about we get to the underlying cause and look underneath the hood? Mm. And then that last piece around in the boardroom and the grandiosity of, well, self-discovery and personal development. I don't even have time for that, but there's subtle things that we can do. For instance, um, if you're in your PMS week, adding some extra magnesium in the evening to preemptively just create that little bit of calm, having your extra CBD available, making sure that you're really hydrating well, prioritizing sleep in different ways, and also just wearing more comfortable clothes. You know, if you're going to wear a different business suit, can you just make it like softer textures that aren't so tight so that we we create a little bit more softness and we allow our expression of feminine power, even in the context of being really ambitious women in the workforce, if if that's who's listening, if that's where you are, because that's uh, that's a lot of the women that I work with. I, I think when I gave myself permission to love my body love its, its softness. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was in the fitness industry for a long time (laughs) and it was hard to love softness. Then I, I wanted my body to be literally hard. Um, when I let myself enjoy that and I, and I, and I start, I actually started with my clothes. I started letting myself wear what my kids like to call soft pants or like, like really softening my wardrobe and allowing myself to exist in this body in a softer way it changed how I related to myself, to my partners. Yep. That and if you're, yep. And if you're in heterosexual relationships, we stop emasculating our men and we create the expansiveness for them to show up as men in that dynamic. Right. There's a fascinating conversation to have about what it means to pass that back and forth. I, Cause yeah, I, I have definitely lived my, some years very hyper, what I would think of as, um, simple masculine. I don't really think of it as it's not bad, but it's way too simple. I wasn't doing it well. Simple is a good word. <laughs> too simplified. I can see the, do you have three or four more hours to continue yeah. this conversation? <laughs> right, this yeah. is, right. I, and I, you just said something that, um, so you've been talking about the, the cycles and the way women change. And um, what about men? So mm-hmm. the, the male perspective, or at least the one I was trained with, one, my socialized masculine growing up is we don't change. <laughs> We're stable. We're not stable. Oh my. I, I mean, our, our experience, my personal anecdotal experience of my life is that I absolutely vary in how I approach a particular situation. There are times when I want to yell about nothing, uh, you know, and, and you use the word overreact and There have been times where we have, Jolie and I have had a fight or some, you know, exciting exchange. (laughs) And um, when she was done, she's like, I don't know why I overreacted. And I would never use that word, particularly in the moment, uh, because you're not overreacting. You're reacting from where you are right then. And I have times where I will look back on myself and say, 
that's odd. I don't know why that response. was disproportionate <laughs> response. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts about the somebody in a masculine training, body. Uh, yeah, about the the masculine experience of the dynam yeah. dynamism you've been talking about. Yeah, um, you know it's fascinating. All of my work is with women, and I I think when when I think about like kind of stereotypically man versus woman the visual for me is that the the masculine the the masculine is the banks of the river and the feminine is the water and we all have both you know like i think maybe women were 70 percent feminine 30 percent masculine in an ideal world and men maybe 70 percent masculine and 30 percent feminine in an ideal world and there's obviously so many variations to that but the banks are a little bit more solid. They're, they're kind of holding the space so that the water doesn't flood out and it, and it creates the container for the water to flow through and make it to the river and the banks are still changing. That's exactly, so we live on a river. The two of us grew up on a river, we, we're on it right now. I'm literally 35, 40 feet from it. And mm -hmm. that is exactly what just jumped out at me. Yep. And the banks change, but they change slowly. And yep. they change in part because of the way the water moves through them. They're responsive yep. to that. So if yep. we were to take the words masculine and feminine out of this, because my, yep. my, psych my psychologist, my inner psychologist, my inner sex educator are like, don't forget, that's also all crap because because oh, it's so much more complicated. But, but there's something so powerful about the, the image and the metaphor about how that stability, the expectation mm -hmm. that you will be unchanging, right. then also molds you and molds me and my own expectations of you. And allowing ourselves to be freed of, of needing to be 70, 30 or needing to be 50, 50 or whatever, yep. allowing ourselves to do that. I can only imagine that be supporting the physiology, the physiology that I have what I, what I have by, by listening really closely to my body and by tracking and paying attention, yep. that's a way to, to, to steer into more comfort, more growth for me without really needing to worry about whether I am hyper anything or hypo anything, just like really diving into the felt sense of it. And mm -hmm. I, I feel like you've offered an invitation to yeah, to just pay more attention and then, and then, but then that there are really practical things and that we don't have to accept like the, the two steps that might be offered by our current practitioners. Mm -hmm. We can reach further than that. One of the places people can reach is directly to you, which makes <laughs> me really happy because this is not my wheelhouse. How can people find you? And yeah, so we'll put the links in the show notes, I'm sure. Um, so Facebook and Instagram, I have a presence there. And I do free workshops online. So the Vibrant Life Workshop is a really nice way to lean in. And it's my way just to really give a lot of solutions and a clear roadmap for free. Awesome. And so it's online, you register. It's just mariahbrown.com forward slash the Vibrant Life. Put Julie's name down as who referred you. And that way I know I can give you a little bit extra love and care. And I have to find my own words other than masculine and feminine and that's an area for me to learn from you um and so you can come and lean in and, and it's virtual and you have your own concierge support and you'll have a workbook to go along and just create a, a the starting point for your roadmap to you know my main area is energy hormones and libido mm -hmm. and so that's probably register for that you're welcome to grab my free adaptogen elixir recipes that's at mariahbrown.com <laughs> You I have? Have yes, I have. I made the one with the nettles. Amazing. Yeah, so and good. I have participated in your free workshop. And so I am an expert in, in the general field that you and I share. And I just want everybody to go sign up, lean into this. Even some of my colleagues who I know are listening right now, lean in. Mariah's language might be a little bit different from some of what we were taught. That's great. That is good news. We need to be learning from each other so that we can deepen our field as a whole. And I learned a ton just in your free workshop, let alone the amazing programs that you offer. Mm -hmm. I really would love to see your work in the hands of my audience because I know it's life-changing. So. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to meeting your, your community.
Fantastic. And Ken, Ken, hopefully that answered your question regarding, yeah. you know, the how the, the change that takes place. I think it is, it feels to me like it's kind of res- more responsive to the water that flows around you in some right. ways and, and more subtle. It's changing, but it's not as drastic and, you know, raging. Yeah. And I, I, I love that, that metaphor. And I, I brought it up partially to remind the, the, the people like me in the audience who might have been trained to think of themselves as unchanging and inert <laughs> and we're not. And therefore more perfect. There's yeah. like a more, there's right. Yeah. There's a in solidity and staticness. We can have the illusion that that is somehow better. Mm-hmm. Mm. When in fact, they're just different ways and it of just, being. Those, those, um, those ways of being that I ha- that I've engaged in just get in the way of relating. And so this is great. Yeah. I, for the, for the way, for those that are listening, Jolie just gave a really sweet caress on oh. his cheek. Like there, it created a, a sweetness between the two of them that for the listeners, they didn't see that, but I want to call it out. I see, I see the smile. I see the wink, wink. They're going to go have sex when we're done with this. It's, okay. It's true. It's going to happen. It's going to happen as, as typically happens, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Mariah. I'm sure this is not going to be the last conversation we have Mm -hmm. about this. I really couldn't appreciate you anymore. Thank you for sharing your expertise. Yeah, of course. My pleasure. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. I have one more thing to share with you. If you want to pop over to listen to Jolie.com, that's just listen to Jolie, J-O-L-I.com, you can grab my top five relationship guides for free right now. Yeah, get the guides. They're easy to implement conversations that will empower you to create the love you want. It's my mission to make everything talk about it all. Sex, love, losses and learns. Everything is talk about it <laughs> She managed to help me be able to talk about stuff that I once couldn't even imagine saying out loud. Now I speak openly with my lovers, my friends, my family, and you all on a podcast out loud. Relationship work really can change everything. So when you're feeling the rough edges, when things aren't going the way you'd hoped, remember relationships can be messy and that's good news. 